and everybody else has the right to make energy from the sun without unreasonable interference by the utility. Um, we, um, I'm the one and only paid staff person. Everything else is just volunteers, grassroots, the whole shebang. Um, our board of directors is solar users, people who have solar from around the state. Um, I'm not gonna play these videos, but if you wanna get a sense of a little more like, who are we, who's our board, who are our volunteers, what makes people tick. Um, we got lots of videos on our website and on our Facebook page because um, we want um, people to just kind of know what's going on. This is Ricardo Castillo. I love this guy. So I always um, keep him in a slide here. <laughs> He's the best. Um, all right. I don't think I need to do much convincing for this crowd, but let me just for posterity's sake, just kind of quickly go like, why do we need more rooftop solar? Right. So just let's go back 15 years. Um, there were 15 years ago, there were 20,000 solar systems in the state. And generally, if you wanted to get solar 15 years ago, generally, you had to be either quite wealthy or very, 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 very committed. You had to have some kind of technical background or kind of like DIY yourself into your solar. You know, generally that's what you saw with solar and it just wasn't really that big. Here we are 15 years later, over a million rooftops are, are have a solar system on them. We have a million solar rooftops. So they serve more than a million people because more than a million people will live in a home uh, or a business or whatever. And um, so that's awesome. Also, um, just under half of all the solar that's going in now um, every year is going into working class and middle class neighborhoods. And um, about 15% of all solar is serving the lowest income people in the state who are on the CARE program um, discounted energy. Um, this is by no means, a, you know, we're not done. It's just to say we have come a long way in 15 years where now solar is just taking off and working in middle class neighborhoods. Um, and we have the potential to have millions of people um, being able to get energy from the sun um, on, their, on their home, on their apartment building, business, school, et cetera. Why do we need more of it? Um, the way we look at it is a couple of things. First is people ought to have control over their energy bills. People shouldn't have to choose between buying groceries or paying their utility bill. And in general, even if that's not the position you're in, it's an awesome technology. People should be able to use it to become more financially independent, self-sufficient, rather than giving their money away to PG&E or you know, some kind of private monopoly but also power outages. Um, we're now in a situation where because of um, a warming planet, um, it's hotter, it's drier, we're gonna be facing more wildfires and we've got this massive network of long distance power lines that run through wildfire prone areas. We are going to have planned power outages. It's just gonna be a thing that's in our annual, it's gonna be happening annually. And the state has no plan because there's nothing you can do about it um, other than just give people a heads up. The only thing that you can do about it, the way to prevent power, your power from going out is to have solar and then a battery where you can store the extra energy um, in your home or your garage or your basement or whatever. And so when um, the power goes out, the battery can then take over. And we're gonna talk about this a little later on. Um, when you get a critical mass of homes and businesses and schools in a neighborhood and in a community that all have solar and a battery, you can string all those systems together into what's called a microgrid or a, a virtual power plant that actually when the power goes out in a, in a community, everyone can keep the lights on um, even if they don't have solar. And so that's another reason why we need more rooftop solar so that we can also have more solar powered batteries so that we can outage proof our communities in a warming planet when power outages, when the grid's gonna go down increasingly frequently. Then there's just the issue of climate change. The state has a very aggressive goal of getting to 100% clean energy, zero fossil fuel by 2045 um, to get everyone to switch from gas cars to electric cars, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and the CEC, and I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm just saying this is happening, whether you like it or not. This is what the state's doing. And the CEC, um, the California Energy Commission, says that in order to do that, to get off fossil fuels by 2045, um, we're going to have to triple every form of wind and solar that we already exist. So this would be solar farms out in the desert. This would be wind farms, like way out in the hinterlands, and it also includes rooftop solar. Um, so what happens if we get rid of rooftop solar, if we don't keep it growing? That means we're going to have to build more solar farms, more wind farms out in places where they currently are undeveloped. And, um, you know, the turtles have something to say about that. Anyone that kind of thinks that we ought to protect what's left have something to say about that. Native Americans and the tribes have something to say about that. Mm -hmm. So we need more rooftop solar because we have a built environment already with rooftops the sun is falling down on. 
and we need to triple it just to meet our clean energy goals or else it's gonna be a heck of a lot harder if not impossible to be able to meet it. The fourth reason why we need more rooftop solar is that it saves everyone money whether you have solar or not because the biggest thing that's driving up our, our energy bills, that the reason why we're paying out of our nose for electricity is long distance power lines. This is the thing, it's the elephant in the room. Um, and, and the utilities have an interest in spending as much money as possible on long distance power lines and charging it to rate payers. The reason why is because the profit model, the deal that they have with the state is that for every dollar that they spend building and maintaining long distance power lines, they get a guaranteed rate of return, a guaranteed profit. So they're incentivized to spend more of your money and my money and all of our money to build and maintain power lines, whether or not it protects us or does any good. And so as a result, over the last decade, um, power line spending has skyrocketed. It, this, you can say this is commensurate with the increase in electricity bills and utility profits have skyrocketed commensurate with long distance power lines. There is one thing that mitigates the cost of long distance power lines and that is rooftop solar. And the reason why is when you make your own energy, you don't use long distance power lines. When you give your surplus energy over to your neighbors, they don't use the long distance power lines and that reduces wear and tear, which means you have to spend less on maintenance and you don't have to build as many new power lines. And in 2018 alone, the state canceled 20 massive long distance power line projects and save the state in that year alone, $2.6 billion, which benefits everybody one year alone. So we need more rooftop solar because it just makes the whole grid cheaper over the next 30 years when we're going to have to be making this big transition. We don't have to build as many solar farms, as many wind farms, as much long distance transmission, and that's good for everybody. So then utilities, um, you think, okay, great, good, we're, we're set. Um, we're, we're, but no, because the utilities want to double the cost of going solar. And so that's what the fight is about. The particular policy that is at issue here, you have heard it, and I, somebody mentioned net metering. Just quickly, here's what net metering is. So if you have solar, mostly you're making the energy, you're consuming it. So you, it's powering your lights and your fridge and the whole shebang. Um, but you many times are going to be making more energy than you're using. And when that happens, the energy goes out of your house, through the wires, and into your neighborhood. And then the utility takes that energy and it sells it to your neighbors. Um, and then you get a bill credit that's equal to what they sold it to the neighbors. Um, and that's net metering. And then the next time you use the grid, um, that bill credit applies. And um, that is the key foundation of rooftop solar. It is the reason why solar is taking off, not just among wealthy folks 15 years ago, but among working and middle-class neighborhoods, because it allows you to be able to get actual compensation for the extra energy that you're giving back to the grid, pay off the system more quickly. And that's why people are doing this whole thing. It's a win, 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 win. Um, utilities hate it because they're a monopoly and monopolies don't like it when all of a sudden they have to pay somebody else for something that they said, oh, no, no, wait, we do it. They're kind of like, no, 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 you pay me, I don't pay you. And so they just hate net metering. But the other reason why they hate net metering is because net metering facilitates rooftop solar and rooftop solar mitigates the cost of long distance power lines, which mitigates their profits to some degree. And they don't want to have to do that. And so here's what they're proposing to the California Public Utilities Commission, which regulates the utilities. They're proposing three things. One is to tax your solar. Um, if you live in PG&E territory, um, they're proposing that you'd pay 80, an extra $86 a month just for the pleasure of having solar, a new fee just for having solar. You can see what it would be if you're in the other territories and if you're a larger customer like schools or businesses or farms. That's number one, but that's not all. Second thing they're proposing is in a cut, an 80% cut in the credit that you get for the extra energy that you give back to the grid. Um, so right now it's about 25 cents per kilowatt hour. They're proposing to bring it down to between five and eight cents per kilowatt hour. But that's not all. There's a third thing they're proposing, which is that um, any credits that you don't use by the end of each month expire. Right now they roll over for an entire year and then they expire. This is important because you're doing most of your solar production in the spring and the summer months. You accumulate your credits during that time and then you kind of spend them down as it were in the fall and the winter months. But if they expire at the end of each month, then that's not gonna help you. So if you add all three, three of these things up, we estimate that that more or less doubles the cost of going solar, which means nobody's gonna go solar anymore. And that's it. We had the 1 million early adopters and that'd be the end of it, except they wanna also go after the early adopters, the 1 million who have solar right now. 
and um, they're doing everything they possibly can to kind of crack that open. And for the time being, the CPUC has said that's out of scope, and yet they and their allies are still proposing it. And we're going to talk a little bit about how they are just banging down the door, not just to screw future people that want to have solar, but to screw the people that have solar now. Um, so where is the battlefield? If I had come to you a month ago, the legislature wouldn't have been there at all. Um, it would have just been the California Public Utilities Commission. But many of you have been following this. We just went through a completely, you know, the Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue, and he finds his dad in the bar, the old saloon in the street of mud. And then they, they crash through the wall, you know, kicking and gouging in the mud and the blood and the beer. And that was kind of what just happened in the last three weeks. Um, so the, the whole thing started and the whole thing is going to end at the California Public Utilities Commission. They're in the middle of a year long process to um, revise the net metering policy. The utilities have made a proposal there. Many of our allies have made counter proposals. It's a proceeding that's going to go on for several months. The utilities were not content to just fight at the California Public Utilities Commission. So a couple of weeks ago, they got some of their lackeys in the legislature to introduce what you might have heard is AB 1139. And what that would have done is essentially bullied the CPUC to accept the proposal that the utilities put on the table. And so that's what AB 1139 was about. I think as many of you know, and many of you participated in, and I thank you for participating in this, there was an extraordinary public backlash to AB 1139, um, extraordinary like uh, Assemblywoman Buffy Wicks, uh, I'm thinking of a Bay Area legislator, reported getting 1,500 phone calls from constituents in opposition to the bill. We got routine reports that lawmakers were getting, probably the smallest number of calls that went in was like three or 400 phone calls from constituents. It was extraordinary. And even though the bill was being pushed by the most powerful special interests in the legislature, the people prevailed and the bill, did, the bill, bill was defeated. So that's good. Thank you for any work that anyone here did in contacting your lawmaker and spreading the word. But all this means is we have now just one battlefield and we still have a problem. The utilities are going after solar. So that's kind of where this is all at, but really this is the guy that it really comes down to. The CPUC is an obscure, not very well-known group of unelected political appointees, no disrespect intended. They're appointed by this guy and his predecessor. So what we're saying is, yes, we're gonna fight the fight at the CPUC, but the campaign is really about making him feel like this is on him, that this is his problem. And we'd like him to understand this to be that if things go off the rails at the CPUC, then basically he was the one that handed PG&E the knife that killed rooftop solar. And we suspect that he doesn't wanna be that guy. I mean, we, maybe he doesn't wanna be that guy because he might care, but certainly as a political animal, he does not wanna be that guy for political reasons. And it really doesn't matter what his intentions are. We're assuming he doesn't want to be that guy. So what we have to do is make it really clear that we're going to make you that guy if you don't solve this problem for us. And so um, that's the lay of the land. Now, of course, the utilities don't just say, um, oh, hey, rooftop solar, you're cutting into our profits. So really, we got we to gotta stop you. They would never say that, right? So here's what they do. They've set up a, um, a fake group called Affordable Clean Energy for All. They've admitted this, this is in writing. They've sent it to the CPUC because they have to by law. Um, they have a website that's called fixthecostshift.com. And their story is that all you selfish, greedy rooftop solar users um, have taken your ball and gone home. You don't pay your fair share of the grid. And on top of that, you get this sweet net metering subsidy. It's not a subsidy, but they call it a subsidy um, that is overly generous and is like way more than what your solar is worth. And what that means is all the costs of the grid are being borne, shouldered by the people who don't have solar, who are generally poorer than the people who do have solar. And that's a cost shift, it's unfair, and we need to do something about it. So they make it about equity and um, they're very good at it. And you can see, it's a, if you don't know anything, it's a very compelling argument. And frankly, our MO in this campaign is not to take anyone for granted. So if you've heard something and you're thinking, I wanna really understand this, holler. And we feel like we've got the data and the information and the facts that will make you feel comfortable that what they're saying is utter garbage. But I don't, but, but there's no, ask as, as many hard questions as you want because we understand that they've been very aggressive in this and you're gonna to wanna to know, okay, what's the real story? In brief, the real story is this. This is what they're trying to do. They've you know, burned large portions of the state down. Um, their infrastructure is causing power outages. 
We're paying through our nose for the infrastructure. Um, it's the reason that's driving up the electricity costs. They're sitting on massive profits. They have to blame somebody. And so what they've done is they've concocted a story that seems plausible um, and that's what's going on. So, but a little bit more detailed, again, the villain is the long distance power lines. In, 20, in this year alone, we, the people are gonna pay $4 billion to pay for the long distance power lines. We are gonna pay likely another 5 billion or thereabouts. The last time we had data was in 2019 but the CPUC says that around $5 billion, if not more, is going to be the annual cost to pay for wildfire mitigation. So $4 billion plus $5 billion, $9 billion. Um, over the last 10 years, the public has paid about $20 billion for the long distance power line infrastructure, and the utilities collected about $20 billion over that same time period. That's the elephant in the room. And as I said before, one of the mitigating factors of long distance power lines is rooftop solar, but that's also a mitigating factor for their profits. And so thus, here we are. And so, but you can see, if I have to explain it already, the utilities have the upper hand. The good news is the public is very, very much with us. Um, we did an opinion poll, we, you know, uh, uh, and the, you know, what we found is what you would expect. The vast majority of the public strongly supports doing more for rooftop solar, you know, encouraging it, whether they have solar or not, they wanna have it, or they'd like to see more of it. They support net metering. Even when we give people the utilities arguments without any kind of rebuttal, still, the vast majority of people oppose reducing the net metering credit. And this is Democrats, Republicans, people in the middle, people on either extreme. It's very consistent where public opinion is at. So our goal is we want to get solar and batteries to millions of Californians. And one way to do that, the most important way to do that is to strengthen, not weaken net metering. We want to keep solar growing, about 150,000 um, households and businesses that are going solar every year. Um, we want to keep that going. We want to make it even more affordable um, and more equitable so that the benefit that more and more of a proportion of the folks that are going solar are in working class neighborhoods and renters and, and whatnot. And we wanted to you know, use net metering to drive down the cost of those batteries so that by 2030, all solar is, it's comes standard with batteries um, you know, at a comparable cost and a return on investment. So um, we've gotten the big thing off, you know, one thing we've gotten off the table, we defeated AB 1139, but now between now and December, we've got to win a strong net metering policy at the California Public Utilities Commission, the CPUC. Um, we are calling what the utilities are doing, the utility profit grab, um, because that's what it is. And we think it's an easy way to kind of just understand what the heck is going on. That's Bob the Monopoly Man. Many of you might've heard, we did a big um, rally in Sacramento when the, the AB 1139 was hitting. We're now taking Bob on tour. Um, I think as Mari knows, and you might've heard tomorrow, we're gonna be in front of the CPUC with Bob, um, totally invited to come down at 11 o'clock if you have time. Um, don't worry, we're going to be doing this a lot um, over the next couple of months. Um, but, you know, so that's the campaign. Um, if you want to um, get involved, then here's a couple of suggestions. One is um, definitely come on to this, the coalition website and sign the petition and share it up the wazoo. Um, we want to, our goal, we're going to be delivering um, a down payment of about 30,000 petition signatures from the public tomorrow um, at the CPUC, and we're going to give it to the governor as well. Um, our goal is to have 200,000 by the end of the summer. So, um, no, you know, no job too small. Um, you, you can really make a difference by helping to just circulate this petition. We want the governor to get 200,000 of these um, by the end of the summer. Then um, calling, obviously you guys are activists. You know how the system works. A phone call is more powerful than, you know, a signature. You got to do both. So we're encouraging that and we're encouraging people to encourage others to do that. And then, um, we also need, the most important thing I want to highlight is this, this the CPUC meets twice a month. And um, what we want is over the course of the summer, a growing number of people to be attending their online meetings and signing up for that two minutes of testimony. Right now, about five or 10 people will show up every single time they meet. And what we want is each meeting, it's going to be 15, 20, 30, 50, 100, 150. You know, so that as the whole thing grows, they're seeing that the public is really paying attention to them. Um, so there's lots of other things. We have a whole toolkit that we can unpack in the discussion, but that's the big thing. And uh, the Fresno Bee, the LA Times, and the SAC Bee have already done good editorials um, that kind of broke our way. The Fresno Bee went ahead and actually just unprompted did this cartoon, which is pretty rad um, and kind of tells the story really well. And let me stop my screen share and take questions. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dave. You gave us a lot to think about, believe me. And I loved your cartoon of the turtles leaving the desert. <laughs> that reminded me of um, 
Bernadette Del Charo, uh, who's with the Solar and Storage Association, uh, said in an article that was quoted in the Chronicle, you don't need to build the, long, the big power plant in the desert anymore because the big power plant is in the rooftops of San Francisco. Start so right. Mary Eliza, you set this up. So let me give you the first uh, option to uh, ask a question or to, to continue the conversation. Okay, um, I've been thinking a lot about doing postcard campaigns, particularly to the governor. I think we should just all send a lot of postcards um, to the governor, letting him know how we feel about various um, issues. And this is definitely one that we feel pretty strongly about. Make sure he gets a lot of postcards to make him feel like he doesn't have to look at a poll to find out how popular he is. He just needs to look in the mail and he'll see it. So my, my first question uh, would actually be, what, if any, are the more difficult questions that you're getting from people who don't understand um, what's going on with solar? Yeah, I think the top one is going, hey, I heard that rooftop solar, you know, they, they don't pay their fair share in the grid and that they're increasing costs for solar users. And I heard a number that said that actually rooftop solar is causing people that don't have solar to pay $200 a year more in yeah. electricity bills. You know, what's going on there? Because I don't want my solar, I don't want solar to be hurting people who are low income. That seems terrible. That's my top thing that we get. Now I can rebut it, but you asked me only, I'm answering one thing at a time. So okay, that's the right. question I get. <laughs> okay, how would you like to rebut it? We can play the debate game and I can play the utility and you can play the, the, the warrior and, and, and see who wins. I can probably play the utility better than the rebuttal. Um, <laughs> I mean, so first off, I think you heard me say twice, so I don't want to repeat myself too much. You know, the thing that's driving up electricity costs for everybody is long distance power lines. The thing that is reducing the cost of long distance power lines is rooftop solar. And that's because when you make your own energy, you don't use the power lines. Um, which reduces the maintenance costs and the new investment costs. That's the main thing to understand. But um, if I was just to unpack this one step deeper, if you're paying, if you start really paying attention to this issue, you are going to come across numbers from the utilities, numbers from the CPUC, numbers from CPUC's consultants, numbers from groups where you're going to be like, well, wait, they can't be wrong. So there's a couple of groups that are unfortunately allied with the utilities. They're outliers but you'll, you've heard of them. NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council, TURN, the ratepayer advocate, um, the Haas School of Energy at UC Berkeley run by Severin Bornstein. This is part of the utility echo chamber. Um, you'll see them repeating these numbers. So you might go, okay, Dave, that makes sense. Long distance power lines, the rooftop solar mitigates, but why does, why, I'm hearing these guys say there's a $200 a year per ratepayer number, $3 billion a year. How do they get that number? Are they just lying or like, what do they do? And so the answer there is that all the entities in the utility echo chamber more or less use the same three or four, um, let me try to be charitable about this, questionable methodologies um, to calculate their cost shift number. Let me just give one so that I'm not talking, we can move on to other questions and if people are interested, you can unpack. But let me just give you the top methodology trick that they all use to try to show, make it seem like rooftop solar is a problem. What they do is they count all of the electricity that rooftop solar owners make and consume at home or at their business. And they count that as a cost to other ratepayers. So it's like saying, if you grow your own vegetables in a garden and thus you don't shop at Safeway, or you don't shop at Safeway as much, you are responsible for rising electricity, uh, rising vegetable prices at Safeway. I will just say one other editorial comment, although I feel like this speaks for itself, is, you know, if you just kind of think like what's the foundational principle of ecology, which is reduce the footprint, right? Reduce your footprint on Mother Earth, reduce your footprint on society. And we've kind of said like generally doing that is good. It's good for society. So you have all these people that have invested in a power plant on their roof so that they don't, they make their own clean energy 
and they don't burden the grid, they don't burden society. And they've somehow figured out a way to use math to make it seem like they are burdening society. It just twists ecology right on its head. So there's more of where that's coming from, but that's how they get to these numbers that then cause mass confusion. Among the insiders in Sacramento, we find that once you step outside of the inside, when you get to kind of Joe public, people are kind of like, yeah, you know, of course, but here we are. Thank you, Dave. I just want to remind people that um, if you use that little um, uh, raise hand icon uh, on the um, uh, right hand side of your screen, we can go that way. But also, I just wanted to get to Glenn because he actually raises physical hand. <laughs> Heavens, so, you know, and it, it's, it's starting to hurt. I've kept it up for so long. You know, I, I have 13 solar panels and uh, and you, you now have made me really want to have a, a battery. But the Tesla battery is $10,000. I don't want to spend that much money. Can you tell me a good battery and I'll buy it this month? <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm in, I have solar. I don't have a battery uh, for the same reason. It's pretty spendy. You know, I'm, just a, I'm just a middle-class schmuck, you know, just trying to make my way through the world. Um, and... I don't make, we don't make product recommendations for reasons you can understand why. Our website does have tips. If you're shopping for a battery or even if you're shopping for solar, we have tips. So like a methodology you can use to make sure that you're getting a good deal. But look, batteries are happening. Like, you know, we're all going to have them eventually. And it's just a question of the price coming down to the point where then you feel like you're getting a return on investment and that you can afford it. And, um, Sometimes it just means being patient. You know, I finally, we finally are leasing an electric car. You know, <laughs> it took a long time for me to feel like we could afford something like that. And now we are. The batteries will come like that too. So what I would, generally what I say is don't get something if you're not comfortable with the price, you know, um, get it when it feels right to you. And our website, our consumer guide, the button at the top, um, this is the solarrights.org site, um, has tips that are kind of methods you can use. And you can revisit that every couple of years you know, if you feel like, okay, is it different now or the price is different and you can call those installers back and get another bid. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, Claire, you have a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm approaching this a little differently because my experience is that I retired from the city's PUC um, and I actually think that this fire mitigation cost is part of the cost of business for PG&E and it's on them and they shouldn't be passing it to the rest of us, but that's a separate issue. Um, the San Francisco PUC is an enterprise department <clears throat> and the energy that we sell mostly to the Western grid of the United States um, comes from hydroelectric power. So we sell water. We have all of our water customers on the peninsula and all up and down the state. <clears throat> and we sell power, not only to PG&E and to the whole state, but to the Western grid, when I've <clears throat> talked to, when I've gone up to Hetch Hetchy and talked to the guys in the powerhouse, I learned a little bit about the extent of where they sell and how some of those guys have actually moved to Utah and Colorado to pick up jobs there in the same industry. And what I'm wondering is how, I mean, I would like to see solar power replace hydroelectric because I see our water and aquifer as um, a valuable resource that we should not, and I kind of hate to use the expression, waste in generating power. That if you're, if you're moving water because people need it or agriculture needs it, that's one thing. But if you're moving it just to generate um, electrical power, that to me is, is a waste of a, of a natural resource. So clear um, your question. Do you see this is <laughs> um, how do you see this interfacing with the potential of solar? And is it your recommendation or would it be a, your consideration that like the, the local PUC would find a way to change um, its power sources to solar as well? How do you see this interfacing? 
yeah. And, you know, I'm going to first be honest, I, I, I'm not very familiar with the way that, you know, the San Francisco PUC works. So, you know, I want to try to stay in my skis. My, my feeling is that, but like, I'll give you a gut feeling, you know, which is that, well, first off, you know, I think there are, there are those who I've talked to who seem to know more about this hydro than I do. You know, I feel like they kind of say, Kind of what you said, like if you got to if you got to use it, use it because it's cleaner than burning something. But you know the fish don't really like it so much, and so if we're really trying to reduce our footprint on the planet, you know, it'd be good if we can reduce our reliance on hydro. And obviously, if it's local hydro, then you know you don't have as much of the long distance power line issue. But on the other hand, anytime you have a centralized system, you're vulnerable. And you know whether it's China or the Russians or some kind of other kind of third party terrorist. Um, kind of thing, you know, it is a security issue. And so it just strikes me like, I've never seen something where I, where I felt like we, there, we cannot go wrong in maximizing the rooftops, you know, and, and really pushing for solar and batteries. It just seems like nobody will look at us in 50 years or hundred years and be like, well, that was a bad move. You know, it'll, all of it does is just makes us less, we're just putting our eggs in more other baskets and giving us more freedom to be able to just like let more of mother earth go wild again. Right. And that just seems like a good idea to me. And, you know, so that's my philosophy at least. And it doesn't mean that we don't use it or we have to like say no to hydro ever, but it just seems kind of smart. Also water levels are going to go down. I mean, it's just, it's a very uncertain future. So why wouldn't we just use the built environment as it is? That's, that's how I think of it. Right. Thank you. Okay. We have two more questions, Maurice and then George will be the last. Um, Dave, thank you very much for such a clear presentation. Um, I want to share with the group my personal experience and make some comments that are outside of the scope of what you mentioned, but that are particularly important in San Francisco. As far as my personal solar history, I have a solar system that I installed 13 years ago. Um, I have 18 panels. I live in the marina. I live in the city. Um, 18 panels only covers maybe 50% of my electricity. So getting a battery wouldn't make any sense because I, I'm really not putting a lot of stuff back into the grid. Um, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that I've had it for 13 years and I have no clue how it works and how efficient my system is. And the PG&E bills are really, really difficult to understand. I don't know if, if you can have some comments about that. That's my personal experience that I wanted to share. The comments that I wanted to make regarding solar in San Francisco is that we've got a, um, an environment, a political environment that is pushing uh, construction and raising heights. And there is no protection for people that have uh, one story, two story, maybe three story homes with solar systems that if the buildings next to them go up higher are gonna cast significant shadows and they are gonna compromise the efficiency of these systems. Uh, can you comment on those two things? Yeah, yeah, I can in brief. Um... First, in terms of, um, well, first off, uh, great you have solar, and um, and I the batteries just like solar isn't for everybody. Batteries won't be for everybody for the reasons that you give. Um, also, um, newer solar, like maybe in the last five years, um, you do have a, a much better way of kind of monitoring your system. I was just pulling up my, you can't really see it, but this is my app for my solar. I can see what's what the system is producing every day, and that's because the inverters. Have gotten that much better. So um, you may want to call your installer and just go like, what's, you know, are there, is there any way I can kind of get a doohickey attached to my system so I can get a better sense of how it's producing? Good luck trying to read your PG&E bill. I've given up myself. <clears throat> um, I just want to know that my system, my solar is producing and then, you know, hope it's working. Um, as for the issue of, yeah, I mean, right. Let's say the city is getting denser, you know, higher buildings and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I've felt, Murray, Murray and I have talked about this, is that it definitely seems to me like there ought to be some really clear protections 
for um, existing solar users when there is new construction. And it seems like there's common sense ways to kind of deal with all that. Um, but it obviously has to be kind of a principle of going, anyone that adopted solar, that's good. And if a building is going in, that's gonna cast a shade, that that system needs to be made whole, that owner needs to be made whole. And if that means that then the, the roof that's bigger, that's casting a shade, then has to have solar on it. And the per person that had the solar who's gonna get blocked gets compensated in some way. It would seem like that's good because first off, you don't wanna block the solar. That's good for just the greater good. And then also there's just kind of like some fairness here. Um, and also signaling to people that you'll, your investment will be made whole if there's a situation that you can't control. And right now the California Solar Rights Act um, does protect you, but only in terms of like trees and shade and that kind of thing. So this is clearly a hole in the law that, you know, I don't think it anticipated this. And um, that would seem like that's gonna be kind of important to do um, it, it for people that live in, in increasingly dense areas. Um, and then obviously I was already talking about how we ought to be ensuring that large buildings do have solar because um, that's good for the folks that work and live inside those buildings. And you know the solar homes mandate that requires this on certain new homes, but not larger ones. It's sort of homes that are smaller. So it doesn't really capture this. So this is another example of like, it's so dumb that the fight that we're fighting this year is to defend net metering, the foundational policy. What we ought to be talking about is how do we supercharge solar and really make it work for all kinds of homes, single family homes, multifamily homes, and kind of work out some of these knots that are popping up as the laws are changing and you know the built environment and changing. Thank you. George, quick question, please. Yes, hi, uh, Dave, really good presentation. Uh, my question is, do you know much about PG&E's uh, battery policy for people who are older or handicapped. If you reach a certain age or you have uh, something wrong with you, they will supply you with a free battery. And people should know that and you can look it up and go to it. And that would give you a quick way to store uh, solar power. Thank yeah, you. there is. Th thank you. There is a rebate. Um, depending on where you live, the money has run out. Um, but in some places, there might still be funds there. So it is definitely something you should ask installers. It is they, they have carved out money. But I just got an earful from Richard Scapp a few hours ago, who runs um, Designing Accessible Communities. So he's a, uh, uh, an advocate for disabled folks. And he lives in the Bay Area. And he was just talking about how that program just ran out of money really quick and was managed pretty poorly. But nonetheless, if it's there, if, if, if you're interested in that and you fit the description that Maurice just said, you, you should, or George, excuse me, um, definitely look into it because there are a bunch of um, older folks, medically vulnerable people, disabled folks, people who live in fire prone areas who have gotten a very, very, very heavily discounted, if not free battery. And um, that's good, good on them. That's great. Currently PG&E is saying that they could provide a battery. Now, I don't know if that's true in reality, but that is the answer that they will get right now. If you hear anything more specific or you have an example, like if, if you happen to get it through that program, I would love to hear it. I'd like to hear more examples of how it shakes yeah. out on the ground. Yeah, please let us know, George. Okay, Mary Eliza, the last word is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanna mention two things. Once again, I wanna reiterate that tomorrow at 11 a.m. there's gonna be an action from the CPC in San Francisco. And um, I also want to mention the fact that we're going to have our next town hall for the Land Use and Transportation Committee is going to zero in on only solar panel issues and protection of solar panels. We will hopefully be covering um, what I didn't get to ask Dave about today, which is an example of those community grids, because I believe that's something that we need to really look into right now. Um, we're gonna be covering um, other issues. We're gonna be covering the Shade Act and we're gonna be covering uh, what is my pet peeve right now, which is um, very difficult situations with contracts. Uh, there's no standardization for the contracts. I've looked at a lot of contracts and that's one of the major problems I see with the industry. I also see a lot of charlatans coming into the industry. 
So those are the kind of issues we're going to be dealing with. And I'm hoping Dave will be able to help me put together a program that is as fun as the one we had this month. <laughs> Absolutely. We covered reopening the, uh, the highways this month, and it was very, very exciting. So that's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Dave. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Right, it's great Thank to meet you. Elijah, we look forward to hearing from you about the town hall next week. Do people know where the CPUC meets? The corner of Van Ness and McAllister. 505 Van Ness Avenue. But if you just Kitty, go yeah, corner Kitty, of Van Ness and McAllister. Kitty Corner from right. City Hall across from the War Memorial. Right. Right. That's, that, that's where I used to meet with the civil grand jury next to the Superior Court building. Okay, thank you.